Welcome to the Yogic Studies Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This podcast features in-depth explorations into the traditions of yoga, Sanskrit, Indian philosophy, and South Asian religions. Through candid conversations with scholars and practitioners, we will immerse in the latest and most cutting-edge research on all things yoga. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to episode three of the Yogic Studies podcast. In this episode, we speak with Dr. Antonia Rupel of the LMU in Munich. We'll be learning about her career as a Sanskrit teacher, and really the depth and richness of the Sanskrit tradition. Antonia Rupel is a classicist by training who came to Sanskrit through a series of fortunate accidents. She learned the language as an autodidact, and one of her reasons for writing her textbook, The Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, published in 2017 by Cambridge University Press, was to make the experience of studying Sanskrit easier and more pleasant for others. She's been teaching Sanskrit for 15 years at universities such as Cornell, Oxford, and now the LMU in Munich, Germany, as well as offering courses in a variety of formats online. Language pedagogy is at the heart of her life, and she's currently working on an intermediate Sanskrit reader. It's designed to help students gain fluency in reading in an enjoyable and straightforward way, and it will come out in late 2021. As we discuss in this episode, Antonia will be teaching a new series of online elementary Sanskrit courses for us here at Yogic Studies. We'll be utilizing her textbook, and we'll really be starting from the very beginning. So if you've always wanted to learn Sanskrit with an excellent and reliable teacher, uh, we invite you to join us. The first of three courses begins on June 1st, 2020. And so if you're listening to this podcast episode before then, before June 1st, enrollment is still open. If all goes well, we hope to offer this Sanskrit program online again and on an annual basis. For further information about these courses, you can visit yogicstudies.com forward slash Sanskrit. Okay, without further ado, I hope that you enjoy this wide-ranging conversation with Dr. Antonia Rupel. Antonia, welcome to the Yogic Studies podcast. Thank you so much for making the time. It's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, how's it going uh, over there? Oh, it's, it's good. I mean, Corona makes everything weird, but um, uh, Corona aside, uh, I'm, I've just started a job and I'm having a wonderful time doing that. Um, I'm so glad that we've got the internet. It makes everything so much easier these days, it makes everything possible these days. And uh, yeah, no, so I'm good. Yeah, you've just recently moved back to Munich, is that right? Well, not, not back to Munich. I've moved to Munich. I've never lived here before. And even though, as I'm sure you can tell from my accent, I am German. I haven't actually lived in Germany since 1998. Um, so most people think I've moved back to Germany. And technically sp speaking, yes, I have moved back. But um, I'm th I think I'm experiencing all the culture shock um, that people experience um, that move to this country for the first time. It's the first time that I live here as an adult, basically. Mm. Um, and I like it, but um, it's, it's new and it's different. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you currently have a teaching position at the LMU. Uh, is that correct? And what, what yes. are you teaching uh, right now? Although I guess the semester, semester is probably coming to an end here. No, actually, um, the semester in, uh, so the semesters in Germany basically are a winter and a summer rather than a fall and a spring semester. So we've only just started and we've got another 11 weeks to go. Hmm. Or t 10 weeks, t 10, 10 or 11, one of those. Oh, well, it shows my US bias here. <laughs> And uh, the courses that I'm teaching are, um, so the one big course I'm doing is Introductory Sanskrit, just the second semester. And then I'm offering two more reading classes, one that I'm calling Applied Sanskrit Reading, which is basically um, uh, we're reading a couple of texts that I am using that I have annotated for my upcoming Sanskrit reader. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so what we're doing is just basically trying to get a lot of reading in. And so I'm trying to see how well the annotations to those texts that I've made are working. And I think so far they're working okay. Um, and also I'm going to try to use that course to show students um, uh, most people who, who do Sanskrit, not just for a semester or two, who do, who do it for longer, um, they will at some point probably get to teach some Sanskrit. And if you want to do that, it's always good to know what makes reading a text difficult for your students, how you can make it less difficult, how you can make it pleasant, how you can make it interesting. And so we're going to look at the annotations of those texts that I've made, and I'm going to give them suggestions how they might annotate texts that they're interested in themselves so that they can maybe teach them someday. And so that's one course. Like the rest of the world, you, your, your, your classes have moved into the online space, I'm guessing? Oh yeah, it's all Zoom. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's going well. I mean, as long as the internet is working, um, uh, it's, been, it's been good. And actually, it's, it, it has a couple of advantages because um, I have uh, a few students who, um, uh, for example, were in Munich last semester and now aren't here anymore, but either have gone back to India or are somewhere else in, in, in East Asia. And they can participate in the classes without any issues because um well it's all online and as long as they've got internet at home you know they can be there and that's that's really quite nice yes yeah i mean as you know with yogic studies uh we've been zooming and online teaching and in the kind of online educational space for a couple of years now so sort of a little bit ahead of the curve of everybody reacting to covid and uh i think there's a lot of benefits actually in, in the online teaching space. And it's something that I want to talk to you more about maybe mm. later in this conversation when we talk about your upcoming online Sanskrit courses for yogic studies and yes. thinking about how to take advantage of some of those benefits. So yeah, it doesn't replace in-person learning, right? But there are a number of, of benefits, including geography. Yes, exactly. And I mean, I've been I've been doing the same thing, uh, not quite as professionally as you, but um, for my for my textbook, um, I at some point decided that I wanted to have a, a proper online component for that as well. So I basically recorded uh, videos, one per chapter that I put online um, that kind of replace what I would be saying to students if I was in the same classroom as them. And so in those videos, you basically get what I would be saying to you directly if I was at the blackboard and you were sitting in front of me. And um, you're absolutely right that there are some disadvantages, but there's some definite advantages to being able to teach, um, to be able to pass knowledge on in that way. Mm. And uh, yeah, so I completely agree with what you say. Yeah, and you mentioned your tech, your textbook and some of those digital resources you've made available. And uh, I want to talk more about that uh, mm -hmm. fully in, in this conversation as well. But before we kind of dive into the weeds of all of that exciting stuff, why don't we back up a little bit? And um, especially for our listeners who, who you know, uh, might be less familiar with you, uh, even for myself, we've actually sort of just come to know each other rather recently. Yeah, true. And it's nice for me and for our, our audience to get a chance to get to know uh, the scholar, the, the, the professor a little bit uh, more. Uh, I'd like, if you don't mind, to just tell us a little bit about your background and your story. Uh, tell us a little bit about your graduate training and how you came to not only learn Sanskrit, but to teach Sanskrit, to write a textbook on Sanskrit. I understand from your bio, you're self-described as a Sanskrit autodidact, meaning you taught yourself Sanskrit, which is sort of amazing uh, to someone who has struggled learning the language for <laughs> many years, and I'm sure many of our listeners can relate to that. Uh, so that's somewhat remarkable itself. So tell us a little bit, if you don't mind, uh, your story and how you came to Sanskrit. Um, sure. I mean, I had a lot of help along the way, I definitely have to say that. But basically, so I'm a... Um, uh, I'm, I'm a classicist by, by training and by, and by, you know, all my degrees say, say classics. Um, and uh, in my very first 
term um, in the linguistics lectures, the word Sanskrit was mentioned and I'd never heard of it before. I didn't know what it was. And um, at one point I talked to some of my lecturers and asked, um, you know, it was so Sanskrit, what exactly is that? And would that be a useful thing to learn? Mm-hmm. And um, the person who later actually became my PhD supervisor said, oh, Sanskrit is always useful and gave me, um, he had several copies in his office of um, Coulson's Teach Yourself Sanskrit book Mm. and he gave me one of those um dog-eared and a couple of pages were missing um but it was a wonderful book um especially for someone of 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 my background the book is uh, is excellent if you already know some latin some greek um if you know a little bit about language um structures and and i i I did or i was learning about these things exactly at that time and so i was i was excited i loved that book um and i used it to indeed teach myself sanskrit as the as the title instructed me (laughs) <laughs> That's amazing. And was this as an undergraduate? Yeah, this was um, actually in my very first term as an as an undergrad. Yes, at Cambridge University. Is that right? exactly? Yes, I was. I was at Cambridge at that point. Yes. Wow. And so, had and, you already had a background, say, in high school in learning Greek and Latin and Western classical languages? Yes, I was. Uh, I was really lucky. in In Germany, there's quite a few um, normal state schools that offer Latin, and some of them also offer Greek. And uh, that's actually the path that I took. Um, it was. It was. It was quite interesting. We had Latin as our first foreign language, and then you had the choice between English and French as your second language. And um, if you took French second, you had to take Ancient Greek third. Mm. And my parents figured that you know English is everywhere, and she'll be able to pick that up somehow. And so I um, took the path of uh, Latin, uh, French, and then Ancient Greek. And I actually learned English um, mostly what. Star Trek and um, that's and and my parents even supported my Star Trek addiction at some point when they realized uh, well it's helping me learn English so yay (laughs) well that must have given you a good edge with already that much language training and especially in these classical Indo-European languages I always felt in my graduate training you know at the beginning of my Sanskrit journey that those in my classes who had that sort of background, they so clearly had a leg up on everybody. They already knew all the grammatical terms. They knew what case endings were. They knew (laughs) participles, all these things that for myself, you know, when I started Sanskrit without really any prior language training, uh, I I felt at quite a disadvantage. So I can see why uh, that would have been very helpful. But still, just being handed a grammar you know, and then making your way through the text. Sanskrit is is notoriously a very difficult and complex language. So that's still uh, quite impressive. Well, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I, yes, I definitely did have a big advantage already knowing Latin and Greek, um, especially Greek, because there's many, many structural similarities between the two. And um, I tried to make use of that background knowledge. So not just in Latin and Greek, but just sort of in language structures in general when I then many years later started writing my own textbook because um, knowing about those other things had helped me so greatly Um, and I basically want to make sure that everything that is available to other uh, to speakers of other languages and especially to speakers of English because English is related to Sanskrit as well of course um, to show them how to use the knowledge of other languages that they perhaps already have how to use that when they're learning Sanskrit so that they don't need to basically reinvent the wheel um, when they happen to actually already know the wheel. It just looks different when you look at it in in English or in Italian or in some other language that you're speaking. Or, you know, many of the modern Northern Indian languages, of course, Mm. are hugely helpful when you want to learn Sanskrit. And so by the time you got to the PhD, uh, were you focusing on Sanskrit for the dissertation? I know you were doing comparative work on mm-hmm. the European and did Sanskrit factor heavily into that work? Um, it was it was one of the languages that I looked at. So I looked at one specific syntactic construction that um, occurs in a number of Indo-European languages. So Sanskrit, English, and so on are among the Indo-European languages. And in all the languages where this construction appears, it's kind of odd. 
And when you have something reappearing in many places and it's odd, then rather, rather than assuming that this oddity has arisen independently several times, you try and reconstruct it to the language that all of these other languages come from. Um, it's just easier to assume that an odd thing arises once rather than several times independently. And so that's exactly what I did for my PhD, try and see to what extent we could reconstruct this oddity, which is so-called um, absolute constructions, mm. to what extent we can reconstruct that to Proto-Indo-European. And the main languages I looked at for that purpose were Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, because those are the oldest literary Indo-European languages, um, or the oldest within their branches, at least. Um, and uh, yes, so Sanskrit was, was a part of what I did. But back then, Sanskrit was very much, for me, something that I looked at with mostly linguistic interest. Mm. And um, when I was, uh, well, actually not, not, not finished with my PhD yet, but when I was finished with my PhD funding and was applying for, for jobs, for fellowships and so on, I was extremely lucky to get a wonderful teaching post teaching Latin, Greek and Sanskrit at uh, Cornell University in the US. Mm -hmm. And um, there I started out basically as a, as a linguist, but um, uh, I then more and more um, became just enthralled rolled by the texts that that I read so that I could read them with my students that I read simply because I was interested in them um, and so I turned from being a mostly an Indo-Europeanist, a comparative philologist, to becoming more and more of an Indologist. So interested mm -hmm. in um, the Sanskrit texts, in the cultures that they represent, in um, the, the, the literature, the, the stylistics, um, you know, the entire world that those texts belong into. And uh, yeah, and that was basically also um, you know, you always say that when you teach, um, you have to stay at least one step ahead of your students. Um, I think, yes, you have to, if you want to be a good teacher, you should be a couple more steps ahead of your students. But when I first started teaching Sanskrit, I was definitely, um, you know, always just a little bit ahead of my students, especially when it came to reading literature, because I just hadn't read that much yet. And so there again, I mostly just picked out what I enjoyed, what I what, what, what caught my eye, what I thought was interesting. Um, and it was only over time that I then um, acquired a more sort of well-balanced um, knowledge of Sanskrit literature, of um, the cultures represented by that literature and so on. But in the beginning, it was really me picking up whatever I could find. Mm -hmm. And so as your career as a, as a Sanskrit teacher developed, uh, as you just said, you taught for many years at Cornell University in New mm -hmm. York. And then after that, if I understand correctly, you taught and were the head of Sanskrit at St. James Senior Boys School in, yes. in the UK. So I'm, yes. I'm really curious to hear a little bit about that. Uh, what was that experience like teaching Sanskrit to young boys. And just tell us a little bit about that program. What is going on at that school that there's a Sanskrit program for a young boys school in the UK? That, that itself seems quite unique, is it? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, well, basically, while I was at Cornell, I realized that what I'm mostly um, interested in, what I most enjoy is basically teaching and especially teaching languages. And uh, so I did that at Cornell as, as a lecturer for, for nine years. And um, then for a variety of reasons, I had been looking at jobs uh, on the other side of the ocean. Um, and this job at St. James was advertised for a teacher of Sanskrit who could also teach some Latin and some Greek. And I thought, um, uh, yeah, I, I know that I'm reasonably good as a teacher, but um, if you teach at, um, you know, at a university or at a college, you kind of have it easy because people are already interested in, in, in your courses. You know, they choose them. They, they are there because they want to be. And so um, half of the work or most of the work of 
of a teacher is already is already done and i wanted to see what it's like to teach at a school where basically you have to be able to motivate students you have to be able to fascinate them you have to be able to sort of rope them in and get them interested mm -hmm. um, and i wanted to become better at that and uh, so i applied for the job and um, i i got it um, and so i moved uh, back to the uk um, after after nine years in the us and um, teaching so basically senior school means boys aged um, 11 through 18 mm -hmm. and um, uh, as you say the school is uh, sort of rather unique in that it has a, a Sanskrit program even though it's a secondary school and basically it's it's for various historic reasons that to go into would, would probably take longer than this podcast but, but basically by the time that I had joined it it had developed into a regular academic subject with a regular um, curriculum that was basically parallel to uh, Latin and Greek um, so in the UK you've got these um, nationwide exams um, GCSEs and A-levels which you take at the ages of around 16 and 18 and so there was a Sanskrit GCSE exam or set of exams there was some Sanskrit A-levels. And um, yeah, so it was basically, you know, just, just another academic subject, um, a beautiful academic subject, of course. And um, I felt it was quite a, quite a challenge um, to teach little ones um, because, uh, you know, if you're, if you're 11 or if you're 12, um, especially if you're 12 and sort of puberty slowly hits, you really don't want to sit in the classroom. You know, you want to run, out, run around outside. Um, you want to have fun with your friends and you're not necessarily interested in sitting in a classroom. And so you have to develop I'm not saying anything new to you know any teacher who's listening but uh, you have to develop all these techniques of getting them interested with sort of little bits that catch their attention and once you have their attention um, there's loads of things that you can do um, basically the the attention catching is is the important bit um, after that they, they they kind of teach themselves because they they're they're like sponges and they just take in all the knowledge you just have to make them interested, make them want to open up to, to that world of knowledge and to that language. Mm. Well, we first came into communication, Antonia, a couple months ago, mm. um, actually through the Indology email list serve, where yes. you sent out an email really at the beginning of the pandemic, as everybody was beginning to quarantine, to all of the Indologists and Sanskritists, you said very kindly, hey, I have this uh, Sanskrit for children's uh, workbook that I developed. Would anybody like it? Is there anybody out there who's trying to teach Sanskrit to your kids while on lockdown? And uh, I said, yes, I'd love that. Not <laughs> only am I trying to very poorly pass on some Sanskrit uh, to my kids, uh, but in my own uh, teaching online, I was running a, a seminar, uh, the, the Day of Inaugury seminar uh, to some yogic study students. And I thought, well, we're all sort of kids when you're starting out learning learning Sanskrit. So I thought yes. it might just be useful for uh, adults as well because it sounded like perhaps a, a fun and engaging way to in, to look at the language. And you very kindly sent that to me and many others who asked. And it's a lovely little textbook with lots of engaging examples, just like you were saying, of how do you sort of pull people in with um, crossword puzzles and Sanskrit word hunts. And so were those sort of some of the things that you found um, that were useful to engage an 11 or 12 year old's attention with Sanskrit? Or what were some of your tricks to, to make these boys interested in a language like Sanskrit? Well, exactly what you said. So the things that I that I did in the in the book um, were trying to show them, well, what is Sanskrit, and why on earth would we think that it's a, an interesting thing for you to learn, and why I think it might even be an enjoyable thing for you to learn. So just just giving them a little bit of background knowledge and um, trying to explain to them the idea. Um, of uh, a living language versus an ancient language. Um, so why can we not just start talking um, the way that we would, for example, in French class? Um, and then, of course, we did a little bit of spoken Sanskrit, but uh, that was another way of, of, of getting their attention, um, just to, to, to teach them how to say, you know, hi, how are you? My name is, and so on. Um, and uh, just sort of to try a varied mix of approaches to give 
give them a little bit um, from every angle that I could think of so that, um, you know, someone who just really likes puzzles uh, can get interested. Someone who actually thinks about language um, can get interested. And it may sound odd, but yes, among 11, 12 year old children, there are quite a few who actually think about language um, just, as, just as well, just as intricately as many adults do. So there was that. And uh, there was the spoken aspect. There was the, the exotic aspect. Um, uh, you know, when you when you when you're in England, then then India is a country that's that's far away. Well, basically, when you're anywhere in Europe, then India is a country that's far away, and you have these images in your mind that you maybe have seen on TV or somewhere of you know this 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 uh, beautiful, colorful country with with sights and nature and animals that you don't have at home. Um, and then someone shows you that well, actually, you know, the language that used to be spoken and used in this country for over 2,000 years, you can learn that. And that has an inherently cool factor about it. Mm. Um, and I found that... Um, Actually, I didn't make much of a difference in that respect between my 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 little ones and my my college students because when I when I start teaching new students, I always ask them, you know, what's your interest in learning Sanskrit? Why why do you want to do this? And uh, one of them at Cornell said, I really like the Lord of the Rings. Mm. And of course, Sanskrit has nothing to do with the Lord of the Rings, but I understood what she meant because basically she was trying to say that, you know, this is something that is, that is slightly mysterious, that is intricate, that's not something that I've got, to, that I've got anything to do with in my, in my everyday life. Um, and so that's why I would like to learn it because it's something different. Mm. And so, you know, those are some of the, the many different approaches that I try to take. Just sort of little, little bits that you could learn, that you could um, have a sort of little beautiful nuggets of knowledge. And then I try to sort of uh, to assemble these little nuggets of knowledge, these little pebbles of knowledge into a pile that then slowly got bigger and bigger. And before they knew it, they knew a fair amount of Sanskrit. Mm. And so how many years of Sanskrit would they receive if, the, if these students were successful or took to the language? Would they graduate from the school with uh, a, a very strong foundation in the language? Yes, absolutely. Um, the system that was in place until... Um, last summer, um, that's when the A-level uh, uh, unfortunately was, was abolished, um, uh, they could do, um, uh, would, would that be seven years of, of teaching in that language. So we started out um, teaching basically um, all of them at that point. And then we continued with a much smaller group in the second year, uh, basically continuing with those that, that um, were good at it or really wanted to do it. And then after the second year, you would start preparing for your GCSEs. And so that's a three-year course. And we had um, special books written by my, my colleagues um, from our sister school who'd been doing, uh, who'd been teaching little ones longer. Um, so books written by them we had for the GCSE exam. And then the, the A-level exam was sort of the, 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 the crowning jewel because it involved reading a lot of texts. I mean, really um, broad selection of literature we had. We had epic, we had grammatical texts, we had um, pre-classical texts. So we had, we had um, mm. Upanishads, we had, which, which won't mean very much to someone who has never heard of Sanskrit, but these are basically um, very beautiful ancient philosophical texts. Uh, we had, we made sure that we had a um, balance between texts with a Hindu a bent and a Buddhist bent, because Sanskrit obviously is the language of all texts that are interesting for, for more than just one mm -hmm. uh, faith or for more than just one philosophical approach. And to... they had to read a lot and it was great. It was a great course. Yeah. I, I, as you bring up the religious connections mm. uh, with, with the language, I'm curious, uh, because when I think from my U.S. perspective of mm -hmm. teaching Sanskrit in an elementary or even middle or high school in the United States, uh, what I immediately think of because of really the last 10 years of sort of political and culture wars yes. surrounding yoga and Sanskrit um, uh, the teaching of yoga, for example, in public schools, I, I would think in, in the United States, you know, mandating or even just as an elective, including mm. Sanskrit as a part of children's curriculum might be met 
uh, with certain outcries from some sectors of the population, some parents may be aligned with uh, the Christian evangelical right or something like that. Uh, now that's in a public school setting and that has its own uh, unique characteristics in the United States. But I'm curious at the St. James School, uh, how was this curriculum met from, from the parents? Was it something that was supported? Were there ever criticisms of this? Why do my kids need to learn Sanskrit? Uh, basically, all of the reactions that you that you just mentioned. So, um, Saint James is a is a, is a is a private school, and so um, uh, there, of course, was was more freedom in that respect. Um, and also, whenever I taught it, I made sure to um, show that you know this is not um, an introduction to Hinduism. This is not meant for um, people of one um, religion only, but quite the opposite. It's um, yes, Sanskrit has. Um, the, 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 the oldest Hindu and pre-Hindu texts are, are composed in Sanskrit, but Sanskrit also has lots and lots of other literature that is um, not religious, that is uh, not specifically Hindu. Um, and uh, if any parent approached me, you know, worried about about the the, the Hindu aspect, I could always say, no, you know, you, you don't need to worry. Um, we're teaching this as a language in the same way that, you know, we're teaching Latin without trying to convert boys to Catholicism, for example. Mm. Or when we teach Greek, you know, Greek, a, a form of Greek is the language of the New Testament. And still, um, no one would suspect that when we teach them um, Greek in, in the classics department, um, that we're trying to do this in order to convert them to, to Christianity. Um, and basically, Sanskrit, um, I am treating that in the exact same way. And um, uh, so there were parents who were who were worried about it. Um, however, this was sort of southwest of London, and so the um, Indian population was actually quite um, considerable. And so, for a number of parents, this I think was an interesting way to get their, um, their to get their children a little bit back in touch with their with their cultural roots, perhaps. Um, and so I had a couple of students who basically said that um, they uh, found uh, it made uh, talking to their to their grandparents back in India easier because all of a sudden they had more to talk about. They had this new thing in common, and the grandparents were very proud that their little ones were learning were mm -hmm. learning Sanskrit, even though they'd moved to you know to 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 Europe. And so reactions were very mixed. Um, if someone absolutely didn't want their child to do it, they only um, they had to do it for a couple of weeks, but that was basically it. And that was really quite, quite free from any um, ideological content. Mm -hmm. And that's actually something that I find very important in my work throughout, not just at St. James, but, but generally that I think Sanskrit is something um, so, so broad and so big and so multifaceted um, that it would be um, horrible to use it for a sort of one culture one religion, one language agenda, the way that um, uh, is, is currently happening um, among Sangh politicians in, in India and in the Indian government, mm. because it just limits the, the things that Sanskrit can do. It's so, it's so big, for the lack of a better word, um, mm. and there are so many um, wonderful things that we can find in it, no matter what approach we come from, what, what direction we come from, that it would just be a shame if it's used as a kind of club um, to push through um, one specific interpretation of, of Hindu culture. Mm -hmm. And um, for example, at St. James, one of my very, very best pupils was Muslim. So um, mm -hmm. that, that, that always made me, I, I know that's a horrible thing to say, but that kind of made me happy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's just because the, the, the culture wars here are so big um, that I think it's, it's, it's quite nice when you then have someone who comes from a different culture and who just really enjoys it and who's really good at it. Mm -hmm. And it helps you show that this really is not linked to one ideology. Yeah, let, let's dig into this a little bit further. I mean, I think for most people just in sort of the broader public, if they've heard of Sanskrit at all, their, their notion of Sanskrit is that it's a religious or a ritual you know, liturgical language. Maybe it's used in Vedic ceremonial rites or Hindu mm -hmm. weddings, some skata, you know, rites, funerals, etc. Or they think of sacred mantras like Om, 
or yeah. you know hymns to gods and or also you know the fundamental religious scriptures of the hindu or broader indian traditions bhagavad gita and so forth mm-hmm. um but i think the average person doesn't realize you know sort of what you were saying that there's really this vast literature of sanskrit that transcends any one particular you know culture or religion and yes. that sanskrit really was the elite language of the arts and sciences and that there's this storehouse of sanskrit literature that stretches across just about every genre so maybe can you share with us a little bit about this about the richness and diversity of the sanskrit tradition and how how the language has been used uh, historically Yes, absolutely. Um, uh, so for uh, at least for European or for Western listeners, uh, one point of comparison might be to some extent Latin, because um, Latin used to be the language of sort of communication of of administration and so on um, throughout throughout Europe um, in the Middle Ages and the and the Renaissance. And um, uh, Latin also is the language of the Catholic Church. Um, and so some people encounter Latin exactly because of the, 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 the Latin liturgy, the Latin rites and so on. But Latin is so much more than that. Um, it was, a, it was a, as I say, an administrative language. It was also a language of literature and poetry and so on. And now imagine something like that on a much bigger scale, because India is just geographically, it's, it's enormous. And um, of course, you know, this would have gone beyond the um, um, borders of the, of the current modern Indian state. Um, it was across South Asia and parts of Southeast Asia that we found this language used for um, communication, but mostly for, for, the, for the beautiful arts. So for, for, for literature, for poetry, for epics, for short poems, for plays. Um, for scientific literature and so on. And um, with Sanskrit, we have this huge um, advantage. It's sort of a little accident of history that um, in probably around the 5th century BC, um, someone by the name of Pandini composed a grammar that was basically meant to help people to understand um, the older Sanskrit texts that were still foundational. They were still very important in the religious rituals that they used. Um, But people basically took this grammar, not just as a description of what had come before, but came to use it as a prescription for what Sanskrit was supposed to be like. And so with this this grammar of Panini, Sanskrit basically was frozen in time. And for the past 2,500 years, we have had people composing texts in a language of mostly unchanging rules. So um, uh, most languages or spoken languages change. So if you try and read a text, an English text by by Shakespeare, you might have some difficulties. If you try to read Middle English, you'll have some more difficulties. If you try to read Old English, it'll be impossible unless you've been specifically trained. Mm -hmm. With Sanskrit, there is none of that. You learn the, the rules of this language and you have basically two and a half millennia of literature in this language available. And so when I say literature, there's, um, there's the very big stories, the, the epics, such as the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. The Mahabharata basically is about um, a, a, a family feud, um, but a family feud of, so something that you know, many of us will have experience with, um, so there's the personal level, um, but it's a family feud of uh, gigantic proportions that um, uh, culminates in a, in a um, battle with basically many hundred thousands of, of, of victims. Um, and this story is basically about how to be, um, so I'm, I'm, I'm hugely simplifying this, but one of the things it is about is how to be a good person in society, how to, how to get along with people, how to, how to be a good ruler, how to be a good follower, um, how, to be, how to play all the roles that you're supposed to play in society. Um, it's very long, very, very long, and few people have read the entire, the entire text, but in that text, there are just many shorter passages, shorter stories that um, um, people tell and retell and listen to. Um, the Bhagavad Gita that you mentioned is part of the Mahabharata. It's um, set basically at the, it's, or it's put at the um, b- beginning of that uh, huge battle that I just mentioned. Mm. Sometimes the Mahabharata is claimed as the longest story ever told at something over a hundred thousand verses. Is that true? Uh, 
I would I would very much believe that. I mean, when, whenever you whenever you talk about superlatives, um, all it takes is for someone else to compose something that's you know one line longer, and you you're rid of your superlative. But right. it definitely is a very 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 long story. Um, and so, uh, for example, the other long story, the other epic that we've got, the Ramayana, um, uh, there actually is a summary of the Ramayana as part of the Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata says about itself, you know, what is in here may also be elsewhere, but what isn't in here definitely also isn't elsewhere. Mm. And um, uh, that that may very well be true <laughs> in in a way because it is it is very long, um, and in this in the st- in the way in which it's been passed down to us, uh, it definitely is the sort of the long version, the all encompassing version of a of a collection of stories, basically of 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 um, shorter versions of this story of the conflict between these two parts of the same family. And so the the, yeah, so interesting because they're often referred to as a bardic tradition, right? As yes. something that would have been recited, performed, and that might yes. have moved geographically and changed through a performative tradition. Mm-hmm. And so I wonder if you could say a little something as, you know, sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, no, no. But uh, about the relationship between the spoken and oral Sanskrit and then, you know, the, the composition of written literary Sanskrit? Yes. Um, well, the oldest texts that we have um, in Sanskrit and uh, its, its earlier form, um, Vedic, they were all actually um, not written, but they were composed and then recited and were passed down orally from basically from, from, from teacher to student. And um, uh, great, really impressive mnemonic techniques were developed so that people could um, actually remember, memorize and remember these large stretches of of text that um, nowadays I think we would find um, impossible to learn. And I'm sure that even back then, um, not everyone could do it, but um, there were um, there were people who basically trained to do that for most of their lives and for whom this memorization was an important part of their, of their daily routine. And um, what's impressive is just um, that we have these texts that because they were so important to people were, were passed on um, even though they didn't even exist, you know, they didn't exist in printed form. They didn't exist in manuscript form. They just existed in people's memory. And um, it's unclear um, exactly when these texts would have been written down for the first time, but um, it's pretty certain that for several centuries, we had this tradition um, as a pure oral tradition. So someone would remember the, the um, for example, for the Mahabharata, would remember um, the sort of the structure of the story and would remember um, certain, certain, certain formulae, certain, certain sort of basic lines, um, and would then probably improvise a little bit as they told the story. Um, this is um, uh, similar to traditions, oral traditions that we find in in the Balkans, um, even to this day, um, that we found in, in ancient Greece. So the, the works of Homer, again, Homer did not write the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, but uh, someone who we call Homer composed them orally and they were passed on orally for a couple of centuries before they written, were written down. Mm-hmm. So we see this feature of a, of a tradition that was um, uh, present in many ancient cultures and that nowadays is mostly lost which I think on the one hand is is sad because um, you know it would be wonderful to have all this knowledge at your fingertips but then on the other hand the reason why we don't mem- memorize huge swaths of texts anymore is because um, we have this incredibly convenient thing called the book and then more recently, um, there's also incredibly convenient thing, the internet. And so you just have information in, in writing, you have texts and writing, and so you don't need to memorize them anymore. Mm. So it's, it's sad in a one, on the one hand, um, but on the other hand, um, it's also nice that we don't have to do it anymore and still can enjoy the, the beauty of those texts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's really fascinating and, and something I, I, I've thought quite a bit about. Um, it, of course, there's so much benefit to our, you know, immediate access of reservoirs of knowledge through books mm. and texts. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do the research that I do without it. It's an unbelievable resource. 
Yes. Uh, but one does sort of wonder and sometimes crave a past where we're using more of our mental faculties in those ways. Uh, and it's sort of always remarkable to think about that sort of training uh, and to be able to, I always think of it as like this embodied scripture, like encoding these huge texts within your, you know, within your mind body. Uh, it's, it's a pretty phenomenal tradition that uh, is quite foreign to us, uh, most of us today. Maybe, yes. maybe actors or, you know, um, uh, people in theater maybe have some sort of uh, connection to that or can relate to that in still memorizing scripts and that sort of thing. Also, also musicians, um, I would say, you know, memorizing a piece that you perform or memorizing a text that you declaim. Um, I think they are, they work along the same lines um, in the brain. And I say that not being a brain scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but um, having, having both memorized musical pieces and, and texts, for me, those work very similarly. And, and I always emphasize for my students, I always emphasize the importance of memorizing um, things such as, for example, vocabulary. I always try to make sure that they need to memorize as little as possible because I know that memorization is difficult and try to just make sure you understand as much as you can and then you need to memorize as little as, as, as possible, as little as you need to. But memorization is always very important still because um, when you read a text um, for example, in Sanskrit or in any other language that you've learned and um, your vocabulary is very small and you basically need to look up every second or third word in the text. That's just not fun. Mm. Um, and I want um, the literature that we read and that I give to my students, which isn't, you know, it's not a, um, an instruction manual telling you how to install a, I don't know, a piece of technology or something like that, or a fridge. This is, this is literature. This is meant to be enjoyed. This is meant to be beautiful. And I want them to be able to get that sense of beauty and that you really can only do if you have memorized um, word endings, word forms, and also vocabulary. And so that's always a big part of my, my, my courses that um, everyone does a regular bit of memorization, you know, several times a week, because that way you can um, gain, you know, as I mentioned earlier, sort of these little knowledge nuggets, these little pebbles that you can, that you can pile up to something that then becomes quite considerable. And from this, from this pile, from this little store of nuggets, um, you can then uh, profit whenever you read a text and just enjoy it rather than, you know, laboriously translating it. Mm -hmm. And so once texts were written down and literary Sanskrit takes off. What other types of Sanskrit literature do we find? What, what, what sort of Sanskrit texts are there that people might be even surprised to, to learn about? Well, I don't, I don't know about surprise to learn about because when it comes to Sanskrit, you never know what people already know or already have heard of. But um, so there are quite a few, quite a few plays in Sanskrit. There is poetry of, um, of, of many lengths of poems. So we have long poems. We have um, very short, just, you know, sort of two lines or four line poems, um, which I very much enjoy. Uh, we have a lot of technical texts. So we have um, mathematical texts. We have have medical texts, we have astronomical texts, um, astrological texts, of course, but of course, you know, the, the, the boundary between astronomy and astrology used to be far less clear than it is now. We have um, architectural texts, we have um, texts uh, describing the details of, of um, uh, religious rituals, basically pretty much anything that you might want, non-fiction and fiction, I feel you will find something in Sanskrit. Yeah, uh, basically anything you can imagine, right? Uh, I always... Uh, that's, been, that's been my experience, yes. <laughs> I have a, a, a colleague uh, from Harvard, Nicholas Roth, uh, mm -hmm. who his, his dissertation project, among other things, was looking at vriksha shastras, which is mm -hmm. Sanskrit treatises on tree, trees, yeah. horticulture, horticultural knowledge and gardens and how to grow plants. And, uh, you know, uh, there's another um, scholar, James McHugh, uh, mm -hmm. who you're probably familiar with from mm. USC, who's uh, done incredible work on the senses and smell uh, and now has been working on the history of alcohol and 
uh, <laughs> right. alcohol yes. in South Asia. And there's all this Sanskrit literature on how to brew alcohol, and uh, which couldn't be further at odds with sort of the stereotypes of Sanskrit as this uniquely, you know, pious. Holy, holy, holy and pious language, yes. And so not to say that it's not that, but it's also just been so many other things as this way to codify knowledge systems, right? And yes. That's, that's so important to, to stress because, and this kind of gets us to another question I have for you, but, you know, what are the sort of things that then open up to the student of Sanskrit that you're able to, to sort of learn about and what sort of worlds you're able to enter into? Well, actually, um, just to, to to very briefly come come back to you know you asked you know what sorts of things would be would be surprising to people, mm -hmm. and actually I was thinking um, one Sanskrit text that many people have heard of is the Kama Sutra, mm -hmm. and many people seem to think that the Kama Sutra basically is just porn, so it's about sex, mm -hmm. um, and it's true one small part about of it is about well what a, a part of it is about um, physical intercourse. But so much um, in their text is about how to interact with people on, on all levels. So on the, on the emotional level, on the intellectual level, on the official level, it's basically about how to be a decent person mm -hmm. and a good lover. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there is so much in this text that um, when people actually read it, and actually of this text, there are fairly good translations um, um, available. Um, so anybody who is interested in, in, you know, in, in a text on how to be a, I think, interesting and versatile person, um, um, they might enjoy the Kama Sutra and they might be surprised that, you know, this text is what it is rather than just sort of smart. Yeah, no, it's an absolutely fascinating text. I encourage people to, to actually read it. I think you'd yeah. be surprised at a lot of what you find in there. Um, now, what are some of uh, your favorite Sanskrit texts or authors? Uh, it's always a very difficult question, favorites, you know, so, uh, but I wonder if there's a, a particular author or text that you've been really drawn to, or that you've, that you've worked with. Uh, and if you don't mind, I wonder if maybe you could share maybe a particular Sanskrit passage with us and invite us a little bit more fully in, into this world of Sanskrit literature. Um, of course. Um, of course, you know, when you, when you ask somebody, you know, what's your favorite? That's always a dangerous question because... Um, um, especially people like me, they sort of start talking and two hours later you sort of realize, oh yeah, I've, I still haven't comprehensively answered this question. Basically, there is, there's, there is so much um, that I like for different reasons. Um, you know, saying that you like the Bhagavad Gita kind of sounds trite because, um, you know, everyone knows that text, but there's just so much in there that, that shows you the, the, the beauty of how do we deal with, with the idea that basically one day we're going to die and how do we live our life well before we die. And that's a question that was, you know, that would um, um, keep, that would occupy everyone, every human being at some point. And so this is just something that I, that I like reading in texts from a variety of, of traditions, not just from, from India, but also texts from, you know, ancient Greece and ancient Rome. That question is something that just keeps everyone occupied at some point. And the Bhagavad Gita is just one of those texts that has some very wise and very beautifully um, put thoughts on this subject. Mm. So there, there's texts like that. Then, um, given that my background, my own background is as a, as a linguist, um, I am hugely fascinated by the grammarian, so the grammatical, the, the linguistic tradition of Sanskrit. I already mentioned uh, Panini and his grammar, which is um, composed in a extremely concise style. Basically, the main point uh, the main criterion and when he composed it was how can we shave off m as many syllables as possible from this text to make it a text that people can memorize mm -hmm. and it's, it's now a, so it's com sutra, compact sutra text right so it's, it's 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 written in what we call sutras yes so basically um uh, a sutra is literally a thread 
And so it's sort of something, something minimal that you can use to, to guide yourself or to let yourself be guided, sort of the red thread going through something. And um, we have lots of texts in sutra style. Um, and sutra generally means that it's fairly concise, fairly compact. But Panini, you know, took that to a masterful extreme. And so um, I don't think I will ever reach a point where I feel that I know everything about Panini and I understand Panini as well as I want to understand Panini. There's always many, many more details that you can get your teeth into. Mm -hmm. And so for a linguist, that's very interesting. But as someone who likes not just language but as i say also literature there is a wonderful poem uh, that's called the bhakti kavya so the the the, the poem by bhakti um, which um, purports to have been written at a time when because of some accident grammar wasn't allowed to be taught for a while until some rights had had been had been fulfilled mm -hmm. and so because it's really important to teach grammar bhakti then went and basically put the grammar of panini um, and sort of reshaped it into the form of a story and so it's basically part of the ramayana so one of the very of the best known stories in um the sort of in, in indian cultures um and he uh, wrote the story in a you know in, in in a good and an interesting and an engaging way but each verse exemplifies a rule of Panini's grammar. Mm. And so you learn about forms of the future, forms of other verb tenses. You learn about um, intricacies of Sunday, which is how words change when they come in contact with each other. And it's just so playful, playful and masterful at the same time. So I, I really, really like that text. Mm. And when, when was Bhatti, uh, when did he write his Kavya? Uh, to be honest, I would have to look it up. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, and the, the thing is, because you know Sanskrit is so so timeless, that um, I think you know for most texts we have some dating that we have arrived at at mm. some point sooner or later. I mean, it's it's definitely it's definitely AD rather than BC, um, uh, or, or rather sort of CE rather than BC. Um, uh, but to be honest, I don't know because with Sanskrit, often. It doesn't really matter because um, it's not like, you know, for example, if you learn classical Greek and then you want to uh, read a text that was written in 1000 AD, you can't because the language has changed so much. Mm -hmm. With Sanskrit, it's just the same. You know, you just you just, you know, just just go right in, dive right in and, and you feel at home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also um, with many of these texts, um, maybe not with the Bhatti Kavya, but with many of the older texts, the idea was that it's not really important when they were um, composed in their in their present shape, because actually these are these are immortal texts. They were just dictated basically by by a god or by a deity, by a divine being to an inspired human, to to a seer, to a poet, um, and these are just um, reflections of immortal things. So when exactly this reflection reflection came to be is of secondary importance. And that's something that you find even with texts that are not of primarily religious importance. Is there a particular passage, perhaps, that you'd like yes, to Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, what I said just now, you know, was still fairly abstract. And so I was, was trying to think of, of something, you know, short and, and specific. And actually, uh, this is a poem that I've got up um, above, my, above my desk. Um, and basically, it's a poem that is, um, so this is around 1500 years old. And it's by a poet by the name of uh, Bartra Hari, um, mm -hmm. who, and it's, it's, his poetry is so beautiful and timeless. And this poem is kind of about the Dunning-Kruger effect, mm. which, you know, has come into the media more, uh, more, a lot more recently. So for those who fortunate, you know, are fortunate enough to still not know what the Dunning-Kruger effect is, it's basically the idea that if you understand something a little bit, you feel that you're a real expert and you mm. know it extremely well. Yes. And so that's exactly what this poem says. So I'll just read it to you. Um, Yada kim chi jnyo ha gaja iba madan dar sama bavan tadaha sarva jnyo smit ya bava dava lipta mama mana yada kim chi kim chi buddha janar sakasha dava gatan tada murko smiti jvara ida mato me via pagata and this basically translates as um, when I knew just a little bit. 
um, like an elephant, I became blinded by, by, by mother. And mother is kind of intoxication or madness, but when, it's, when it refers to an elephant, it's, it's, it's an elephant's rut. Um, so I became, you know, like an elephant, just, you know, gung-ho about everything. Um, and then I thought, um, or then my mind became polluted with the thought, I know everything. So when I knew something, my mind became polluted with the thought, I know everything. But then, um, I, uh, when I um, understood more and more, so little by little, I understood things through the contact with, with wise people, I then realized I'm a complete fool. And with that thought, this madness um, went away from me. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just, my, my translation really doesn't do the original justice. In the, in the original, it's sort of nicely symmet- symmetrical and with beautiful patterns of mm. um, how, the, how these sentences are arranged. So um, as always, something is lost in translation. Also, I'm not a very good translator, I have to say. I try to be a good reader, but I'm not a good translator. And so if someone wants to appreciate this, the beauty of this poem fully, then maybe they have to learn Sanskrit, she mm. said, completely without any ulterior agenda. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, there's there's a lot of truth to that, especially in a, a poetical work like that that's using very complex and sophisticated meters and ornamentations. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole art and science behind it that you can't simply reduplicate in, in the English. Is that right? Yes. Um, I find that um, in order to be a good translator you basi- of, of poetry, you basically have to be a poet. And you have to know not just the, the source language, but your own language extremely well. And to be a sort of craftsman or uh, yeah, cr- craftsman, craftswoman in mm. your own language. Um, and so translation is, it really, truly is an art. And um, there is much beauty in, in good translations by, by experienced translators. But very often I find that this unique combination that you have in the original of someone to say, deciding not just what to say, but how to say it, um, uh, that this just makes it so, so beautiful and so enjoyable to be able to read these things in the original rather than in a translation, which is sort of a, you know, it's not immediate. It's um, a translator has decided that this is the best way to render that ancient combination of form and contents. But if you learn the language, you can see what this person thought, felt, and how they decided to phrase it in a place a long time ago, um, and also, um, uh, you know, far, far away. And um, you somehow feel, or I at least feel, um, that I connect with the people who compose these things on such a personal level. I mean, sometimes you read poetry and you look up and you think, that's exactly how I felt yesterday when I saw this piece of news or when I talked to that person. But here I've got someone from a different time, from a different place. They've encountered the exact same thing, have asked themselves the exact same question, but they were able to phrase it so much more beautifully than me. And that's just such a human connection that I just really enjoy. Yeah, well, I think Bartha Hari's warning, the limitations of our knowledge definitely ring true today. And uh, oh, yes. Always, oh, yes. They, they, they particularly uh, resonate with, I think, a PhD student uh, who gets ever <laughs> deeper into a specialized area of knowledge only to learn that they, whatever they thought they knew about a subject is less and less as the, our, our knowledge seems to, to compile uh, more and more. You know, it, you're absolutely right. It, it applies to PhD students very much, but I find that um, as a teacher, it's something that I need to also regularly be aware of because um, I've been teaching Sanskrit for, for a while now, but still I get questions from my students that I'm not able to, to answer. And I think it's so important to then say, you know what, I don't know. Here's how I might approach the question, sort of just from a logical point of view. And here's the resources that I will use to answer that question. And if that still doesn't help, you know what, I'll just look it up uh, for next time. Mm. And to be able to say, look, you know, I know something, but I definitely don't know everything. Um, And to use that as part of your teaching. I think that's really, really important because we get all these people who claim to know everything. And exactly as you say, once you've really delved into a subject, for example, for a PhD, um, you realize that, what you know is so hugely outweighed by what you don't know. 
Mm. I was just having that exact conversation uh, last week in a very different context, but with yoga teachers, Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes yoga teachers are put on this strange pedestal, not unlike perhaps the Sanskrit teacher, where it's (laughs) sort of assumed that they know everything. And you're doing, I think, an injustice to yourself and to your students if you sort of play along with that. And yes, I think there's ethical questions there, but also you're missing out on opportunities for everyone to learn. And I think, you know, this attitude of humility and and turning those questions into, you know, learning opportunities to say, you know, I don't know, let me, let me go look that up. Let, I'm going to come back to you on that. And, you know, and um, I think it humanizes the learning process. And I think in terms of a teacher student relationship, it's very important, you know, of kind of modeling that for students that, you know, even as a teacher, you're, you're still constantly learning uh, and, and evolving. Absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't have so, put it better. Um, I want to uh, move, move forward a little bit here. One thing I wanted to ask you, uh, another mm-hmm. just uh, stereotype, let's say, of the language or, or something that one hears often, if Sanskrit comes up, <laughs> is that Sanskrit is a dead language. What do, you, what do people mean by that when they say that Sanskrit is a dead language? And is this an accurate phrase for Sanskrit today? Um, well, uh, I dislike the term dead because it sounds negative. However, there are things that, there are aspects that dead things and languages we call dead have in common. So, for example, a living language. I would probably mostly learn in order to be able to to speak to people. And in a living language, new things would be formed every day, new sentences would be said every day, new new works would be composed, new texts would be written on phones and so on. Um, Whereas in a, a dead language, or as I prefer to call them an ancient language or a literary language, the the main point in learning them very often is not necessarily to you know go down the street to and and order a pizza or you know meet up with your friends hang out and chat but the main goal i would argue for most people when they learn sanskrit or latin or greek is to be able to read literary texts mm. and these texts they don't they don't change they are in the form in which they are for the most part or almost entirely um, and so in that sense they are they are dead they are they are not changing anymore they're not developing anymore they just stay yeah unchanged and so um, when we talk about a language as a dead language that's basically what we mean that our main goal to learn it is to approach and understand and appreciate these things that are not changing anymore these texts these elements of literature However, um, you can revive an ancient language and um, then it's not dead anymore. And there is a big spoken Sanskrit movement. Mm. Um, and so in that respect, Sanskrit is not dead anymore. However, um, the, the, the revived form of a language won't necessarily help you understand or and won't necessarily help you read um, the, the ancient forms of the language because um, with most languages that have been revived, so for example, Sanskrit or um, uh, modern Hebrew, mm. um, and to, to a certain extent, uh, languages like Icelandic, um, if you speak modern Hebrew, you won't necessarily be able to read and understand everything in the Hebrew Bible. Mm. When you speak, for example, Hindi, you won't necessarily be able to, or you won't be able to just fluently read um, any Sanskrit text because those texts are um, not just, as I say, sort of instruction manuals, that's always my, my go-to comparison, but they are literature, they are intricate, they, are, um, they have many elements in them that those spoken forms of the language um, have actually got rid of in order to make the language more easily speakable. Um, and uh, so I would say that no, Sanskrit is not dead, uh, but Sanskrit for me uh, the, the focus definitely is on Sanskrit as an ancient language, as a classical language, um, because I mostly learn Sanskrit and I improve my Sanskrit or try to improve my Sanskrit a little bit every day in order to be a better reader and better appreciator of those texts. Mm, yeah. And so I, that, that would be my take on this. Yeah, I, that's, that's a really helpful and clear answer. Um, and I think 
it's also not dead in the sense that it's alive, you know, in the academies, it's alive in the ashramas and gurukuls. It's it's very much alive in the way that there are there's a huge international community, or you know, yes, exactly, of individuals who are studying Sanskrit, who are translating, who are engaging with the language very, very actively. Uh, we have the World Sanskrit Conference, you know, every every few years, which unfortunately, uh, the next one has just been postponed. P- postponed, only postponed, not cancelled, just postponed. We That's hope. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I sort of think yeah. of it as like the World Cup of Sanskrit. <laughs> Yes, uh, the yes, National exactly. University every what three three or so years, I believe. And yes, I think it's uh, th- three to five. It's it's varied a little bit, but I think every three years. Yes. Yeah, and I and I just yeah, so, my first World Sanskrit Conference, the last one, which was at um, uh, UBC in Vancouver, Canada. Right. And it was an incredible experience. It was one of the, one of the best conferences I've been to. It was it was so incredible to just walk into every single panel and have it be interesting and relevant um you know yes there's so many areas of specialization you know and you're not going to be interested in in all of it just like anything but uh it was so incredible to see it was a huge conference there was thousands of people from all over the world and and because of that, there are just so many panels that um, you just um, either you attend all you know the them in their entirety, or you just dip in and out um, and just listen to one talk. There's just so much that either you already know you're interested in, or that's often my favorite talks um, when I see something that I know nothing about but think well, that could potentially be interesting, mm-hmm. and then I um, get an introduction to this whole new world through a talk that you know I hadn't originally even planned on going to, and so no the the World Sanskrit Conference is is is, is beautiful and wonderful in many many ways, and um, uh, I feel that and and you're absolutely right that when we you only know, say you know Sanskrit is so very alive, but in in sort of in defense of the term dead language. Um, mm-hmm dead in this context is used basically as a technical term to mean, um, you know, a language where the majority of the texts or what we consider the important texts exist and are not being created anymore. Um, it's, it's a technical term in the same sense that, you know, when we talk about computers, there's this thing that we have in our hand that we call the mouse. And everyone knows that when I talk about a mouse in that context, I'm talking about a computer mouse. No one will stop me from calling it a mouse uh, just because it isn't furry, warm, alive, doesn't have ears, doesn't have a tail, and so on. Everyone knows that when I say mouse in this context, I mean computer mouse. And in the same sense, the word dead is used when applied to languages. However, mouse is a fairly neutral term. Whereas dead is an emotionally very, very loaded term. And so I can completely understand everyone who doesn't like the term dead language, but um, as a, you know, as an attempt of, um, uh, def- to, you know, towards the defense of this term dead language, it really is dead in a very specific sort of technical sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and in order to avoid that, you know, if we talk about classical languages or literary languages, I think um, that, uh, that, describes what we're talking about in a way that's more easily intelligible to someone who comes to this as a as a, as a non-linguist as a non-specialist because mm-hmm. when you hear dead language you don't realize that people are using it as a technical term you know the word dead you know the word language so you assume you know what what people are talking about mm. so in 2017 you published a book the mm. Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, which I'm yes. holding in my hands here, and is <laughs> a lovely book. Uh, I've got the, the the paperback here in front mm-hmm. of me. And uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to write this book and why did this emerge, um, I imagine, out of your own teaching experience. And mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about uh, what went into the making of this, um, I have to say, fantastic text. <laughs> Thank on you. Um, well, so exactly as you say, it came as a result of my own teaching. And uh, basically, this was while I was at Cornell, and I was teaching Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit. And for Latin and Greek, I had these... Um, textbooks that I really enjoyed using and that my students really enjoyed and found very useful. And for Sanskrit, I just felt that any book that I used, there were always 
a number of, of issues with it, um, uh, partly, you know, within the books themselves, but very often simply because um, the students that I was teaching were just so diverse um, in their backgrounds that I couldn't really take any, any prior knowledge for granted. Um, you know, many hadn't, had never learned another language before. Um, uh, many had... Um, you know, many weren't, weren't in the arts or humanities at all, were engineers or physicists. Um, and so basically, I found myself just creating lots and lots of um, um, supplementary materials for the books that I, that I was using and that I was trying out. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a, a friend of mine um, from, from Cambridge who works for Cambridge University Press, um, I, I sort of mentioned this to him when we, when we happened to meet just by chance at a conference. And um, he then said, oh, by the way, you know, a colleague of mine is interested in commissioning a Sanskrit textbook. Would you be interested in doing something like that? And I was really excited because I thought that there would be a real, you know, real um, potential to, do, to have a very positive impact on the field if, if I was to write such a textbook um, and if I, if I you know, did it well. And so over the next 10 years then actually this book developed um, and uh, changed form. I used, uh, used it to teach from in my classes and would always take notes. Okay, students find this easy. Mm. Um, this is clear. For this, we need more exercises. Um, this needs to be rephrased and so on and so on. And then after a long time and all sorts of organizational hiccups and restructuring on part of the publisher and everything this book then came out in exactly as you say 2017. Mm, yeah that's that's fantastic and what a gift to kind of be able to test it out like that over a long period with students and to get that feedback and I think that really shows in the clarity of the text and in the presentation and the progression uh, of the grammar that you've laid out and as you know as I've told you you know, with, with yogic studies, as our online platform has grown, one thing I really wanted to do was to create a, uh, a really solid and in-depth Sanskrit program and to have that be a part of our core curriculum and to make that available globally. And I knew that this was not something that I could or wanted to teach. <laughs> and I really wanted to find uh, an expert who's passionate about teaching Sanskrit. And when I was thinking about who to reach out for, I knew I wanted whoever the teacher was going to be, I wanted them to use this book. <laughs> I thought it was, it was the clearest presentation. Uh, you know, I, I grew up, you know, in my, in my graduate training, I used the Devavani Praveshika of mm -hmm. Robert and Sally Goldman. And I love the Devavani Praveshika. It's sort of what I learned with. And so it's, it's very familiar to me. I constantly still refer back to it. Oh, absolutely. It's a great book. It's a great book. But it's also, uh, in my experience, as I said earlier, not having had any you know, classical language training prior, it, it was also a challenging book. You know, you're learning... Uh, grammatical concepts using Sanskrit technical terminology, you know, so you're, you're not only le learning in English what a past passive participle is, but you're also learning bhute credenta and, and these sorts of technical terms. And uh, so there's an, there's an additional learning curve with a text like that, that I've found in my own teaching now, uh, especially for people, you know, with much less background knowledge, uh, those, those hurdles can be a lot. And so I think this text, the Cambridge Introduction to Sanskrit, is just very, very accessible, as you say, for people who don't have that sort of a background. So I knew whoever I was gonna get to teach these courses, uh, I wanted them to use your book. And then you reached out uh, with that email and I got in touch with you and I thought, well, you know what? Why don't I just ask her? Maybe, maybe she won't be too busy. Maybe she'd be into it. And I was so pleasantly, uh, surprised to receive your your quick response and your enthusiastic yes to teach these courses and uh, well obviously this is a terrific opportunity uh, you know to be able to teach so many people in so many different places um, who you know are uh, united by their interest in in yoga but I'm sure will bring many many different backgrounds to the course that's just um, that's a fantastic opportunity so how could I have said no <laughs> absolutely and so just for our listeners if you don't know we have a a three-part series of elementary Sanskrit courses coming up. 
with uh, Professor Rupel. And the first course, Sanskrit 101, begins on June 1st, which is just, I think, under two weeks away. Or, uh, it's coming up uh, qu quite quickly, depending on when you're listening to this podcast. <laughs> and uh, so why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about this series of courses, what students uh, perhaps can expect. Uh, but first, you know, who who is this course for? Who might be interested in taking this online Sanskrit course with you? Well, I think it's for anyone who's interested in Sanskrit and who maybe doesn't have access um, to a university course, um, you know, who is not currently enrolled at an institution that offers Sanskrit um, as part of their general offerings, which I think is the majority of the population of this planet. Um, and so I, it's a course that I'm going to try to make as accessible as possible. I am going to expect um, uh, very little background knowledge. I want to basically show people who um, speak English um, how um, language works and specifically how Sanskrit works. I want to um, show them the sort of the structures um, that languages use to convey information. Language is a system of conveying information. I say something because I want you to know something. Um, and there's all sorts of systems behind that. And I want to introduce people to those systems. Um, I want them to understand the systems so that when they understand something, there is, there is no um, rote memorization, rote learning necessary. Um, because I find that when I understand something, I remember it, whereas if I don't understand it, then it doesn't matter how much I try to sort of remember it as a random fact, I, I will not remember it. So there will be, um, the emphasis will be on trying to, trying to understand things. There will, as I mentioned before, there will also be, unfortunately, more than enough memorization of, of, of word forms, of vocabulary. And um, what I will try to do is, um, or what the book also tries to do is, because you know we are, we are learning a language, um, probably because we are interested in um, being able to read specific texts, to be able to access specific um, intellectual traditions. Um, and I assume for many of the people taking this course, there will be a specific interest in in, in yoga. And so what the what the book does is um, as soon as is humanly possible, or as soon as is Antonia E. possible, I introduced original readings in the book, rather than giving people just exercises and sort of sentences written by me. As I said before, I'm not a poet, so what I write may be grammatically correct, but it's probably not very beautiful. So to, co to complement that, as early as possible, I will get people to read original texts um, and just to appreciate the things um, that we are trying to get to know, that we're trying to get to know better, to give them a taste of as many different texts and genres as, as possible and to do that um, as early as is feasible. And so basically, if you think you have any interest in, in, in learning Sanskrit, um, the text, uh, sorry, the course is um, split up into, into three units. Um, each of them, I believe, is, is, is 12 weeks. And um, what we will be doing in those courses is just um, go through all the relevant bits of Sanskrit grammar. And by relevant, I mean these are things that you will encounter if you read uh, most uh, straightforward or not 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 hugely difficult texts and that when you come out of the at the at the other end of the series of courses that you will then be able to um, with the right kind of um, um, aids and resources that I will point you to to um, approach most texts that that you have a specific interest in whether it's 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 patanjali whether it's the yoga sutras or whether it is um there's lots of beautiful narrative literature or whether it's one of these many many collections of of short poems uh, whether it's the epics whether especially if you want to read the bhagavad gita um basically i originally wrote the book in order to have, um, enable people to read specifically the gita because i know that it's such a, a popular text mm. so any of those texts if they are what you're interested in then I hope this text, this course will be, will be for you. Beautiful. And as you mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the students uh, at Yogic Studies and folks who will be, I think, both listening to this podcast, I imagine, and also taking uh, this course, they come from a background as a student uh, or a teacher of yoga. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any thoughts in particular, you know, what, um, what, what are some of the benefits 
for a yoga teacher or a student of yoga, why, why might it be useful uh, for, for yogis today to, to learn Sanskrit? Well, I mean, some people approach yoga simply um, from, the, from the postural aspect, so simply as a set of, of physical exercises. But um, um, yoga as a system, and um, you are probably better um, able to describe this than me, but yoga as a system or as a series of systems is not just a set of physical exercises, but rather the physical exercises are there to prepare the mind um, to, uh, for the mind then to be able to um, do things that it wouldn't be able to do otherwise, understand things, think things through, appreciate things, appreciate the world around us, appreciate ourselves, appreciate life. And um, if what you're interested in is basically just the postures, then I think that's, that's, that's already great because, you know, there is a reason why postural yoga is so very popular. Mm. But if you, if you are able to um, read, to understand Sanskrit, not only will you be able to understand the names of the asanas, but that's kind of something that you could even pick up on the side, but you will be able to read the texts um, that uh, describe the systems, the thought systems of, of yoga. Um, and you will be able to understand what you're doing and appreciate what you're doing so much more connectedly and, and holistically. Mm. And so it's, you know, you will not just do something because your teacher tells you to, but you will be able to understand why you are doing this and why your teacher is telling you to do it. Mm. Fantastic. Good. Well, I think we're starting to kind of wind things down here. And mm. um, I wonder, is there anything else that you wanted to share with listeners uh, about the course, about the textbook, or about the Sanskrit language in general? Anything we didn't get to touch on here that you were... Well, mostly just that I'm really, really excited and really looking forward to the to the course. I think the format um, um, is is going to be great. There's there's always a disadvantage, as we mentioned earlier, to having something that is entirely online. But I think with the way that we've managed to set it up, um, people are going to get um, something as close to a proper in quotation marks teaching experience um, as is as is possible without actually all being present in the in the same room um, and uh, i'm just really looking forward to to getting to know people to finding out more about um, the people who take this course um, and you know to hear from 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 all of you why you're interested in this, um, what your what your goals are. Um, I'm hoping to be able to, um, you know, adjust the course a little bit uh, so as to um, reflect people's interests. And um, for me as a teacher, the the, the, the textbook, um, I, I dedicated it to my students. And that was not meant as a, as a sort of formality or something that sounds nice. It really is that um, the best way that I find to improve my, my Sanskrit and my understanding of Sanskrit texts, my, my understanding of the Sanskrit grammar is to teach it. And so for me, the chance to be able to teach that many people is just um, an enormous opportunity. And so... Uh, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to it. <laughs> well, we're very excited as well. And uh, yeah, I think that's one of the real pleasures of online learning in my experience is the, you know, when you are in a non-physical location, all of a sudden, the boundaries and levels of accessibility of who gets to take the course totally open up. I sort of naively walked into that. I didn't really think about that at the beginning of all of this. I thought, well, it'll probably be mostly people from the US or North America, but all of a sudden you move into the online sphere and uh, a lot of those boundaries uh, disappear. And there's been, every time we've done a course online, just this incredible and truly international community of students that all gets to come together and uh, a really lovely learning environment, uh, I think, for everyone. So uh, you, you we, get you get to meet all those people that normally you would never, you know, come across in your in your everyday life. Absolutely. And that's that's just it's just fun. And so for me to get to make this high quality language training in Sanskrit accessible and available like that uh, feels really important and is a great service, I think, that we can offer. 
Uh, and we hope that this will be of interest you, to academics and non-academics alike, to yoga practitioners, to people who've never done a downward facing dog in their entire life, but anybody with uh, just a curiosity to, to learn uh, this ancient language and to uh, dive into uh, ancient cultures, uh, Indian philosophy, religion, literature, and, and all of these wonderful things, I think that we've touched on throughout this conversation. So thank you so much, Antonia. And uh, we'll be sure to put in the show notes, you know, all of the information about the upcoming courses for anybody who's curious. For those of you who are already in the course, uh, we're excited to see you soon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so thanks again for your time, Antonia. Thank you so much for having me. This was, this was a great pleasure. This has been a lovely conversation. So thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, please uh, take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.